Welcome to the Grow to Amazing podcast. I am very happy to welcome Dr. Christine Waller. She is one of the doctors that uh, helped me out in some of my difficulties and, and health issues that I had five, six years ago. And uh, so she, I was impressed and very happy with the care that she brought and just the professionalism and the empathy and, and everything that she brought into my treatment. So when I started building my guest list for Grow to Amazing, she was one of the people that I really wanted to have on. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Waller. So thank you. Thank you. So, I'm excited to be here. And I just wanted to read a little bit about you to kind of set the background. Uh, she, Dr. Waller, is an acute care surgeon, the extensive background in pre-hospital emergency services. We'll get into that as well, because I think that plays there. A passion for education and a strong interest in research after completing a general surgical residency. So you went to Southern Illinois University for medical school, residency at the University of Iowa. Are you from Iowa originally or Illinois? Mm -hmm. No, originally from Illinois. Okay, okay. Well, I was going to say, because that's where I'm living right now is Northeast Iowa. My <laughs> sister-in-law went to University of Iowa and is looking to be a PA as well, so, uh, or a PA, so. Go Hawks. She, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go Badgers, but. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Waller fell in love with the lacrosse area and on her first visit to the area. She says it was the people of the city and the Department of Surgery that drew her to the area. Uh, she, you are one of the, the general surgical residency associate program director. Uh, you're a member of the American College of Surgeons, Association of Program Directors in Surgery, lots of board certifications for surgery and critical care surgery. And you were my ER doctor when I came in with uh, an acute or perforated bowel for diverticulitis, and then ended up being my surgeon as well for bowel resection. So uh, got a little history there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anything that I missed in that, that's your official bio kind of, oh yeah, I do have to read a few of the embarrassing things though, but they do have great <laughs> ratings on there as well. Dr. Waller was extremely kind, caring, made me feel extremely comfortable, knowledgeable in my case and gracious bedside manner. I could go on and on. I have great faith in her expertise and very nice, made the procedure comfortable by saying and telling me everything she was doing, excellent care. She was so calming. She made me so comfortable with my upcoming surgery and recovery. Can't say enough good about her care. So have we sufficiently embarrassed you for the day then? <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> so, yes, no one can see, but I think my cheeks are really red. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I mean, it was kind of a transformative life experience for me, definitely going through what I went through and getting the care that I got at the La Crosse Hospital that I got was was something that really made it so much better than it could have been, I think. And I'm probably especially grateful that it was pre-COVID as well, because <laughs> yes. that I can't imagine what going through something like that would be like in today's world. And we might get to that eventually as well, so as part of the discussion. But I would like to kind of step back in time a little bit and kind of decide, you know, have you talk about what made you get into medicine in the first place and you know, what was it like growing up uh, and that kind of thing, if you can just talk about that a little bit. Yes. So I grew up in a, in a middle income class family that no one in the family had gone beyond a bachelor's degree and we had no one in medicine. And I had decided early on, I wanted to go into physical therapy and was accepted at the University of Kentucky into their physical therapy program. Okay. I was always involved in sports, sports pretty active person, um, what had to remain active. I was in cross country, basketball. Okay. I was a swimmer, okay. um, show choir, band, <laughs> anything that I could be involved. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anything that I could get myself involved in to try, I definitely would try. Okay. Okay. So, what were your favorite subjects in school and things like that? Um, well, biology. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Right. At an early age, I love to dissect things. Um, <laughs> let's see, what else? I would say band and music. I absolutely connect with band and uh, connect with music was was a big one. Um, okay. And and Spanish. I love love Spanish. Mm -hmm. Okay. How was life growing up? I mean, was your family pretty good? And did they kind of were they accepting of you? Kind of taking the path that you took, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I think that um, 
I was their very active child that um, <laughs> kept them very, very busy. And um, my sister, great person, my best friend, they, everybody has been extremely supportive of the path that I took. I mm -hmm. took a very different pathway. So I was, I was um, on the path to go into physical therapy. And then I got pregnant my high school year. I was okay. actually found out I was pregnant before. Uh, I think I found out in the fall of my high school senior year. Okay. That's um, tough. Yeah. That was, it, you know, I've been reflecting on that a lot. I think it was probably tougher on my parents than it was on me. Mm -hmm. um, I already had my course set. I knew what I was going to do. I was accepted. And um, all of that came to a halt. And I remember thinking, well, this is um, not what I had planned, mm -hmm. but um, this is the way it is. Okay. And yep. Yep. going forward, then I just have to worry about a, a, a child now too. And so um, that was a different shift from focusing mm -hmm. on all of my activities and everything I was doing and going out with my friends to now not going out with my friends um, and trying to take care of myself. Cause of course I was also sick nonstop with the pregnancy. So yeah. um, it was, it was definitely a different shift, but yeah. I, I, looking back, it was just what I, I felt like it's what I had to do. You just change mm -hmm. plans. Mm -hmm. Were you doing college at the same time that you were trying to raise a little one or were you just working at the time to try and make, you know, make a path forward? No, actually um, my, my dad owned his own company and the town is small construction maintenance construction okay. company. And so I started working for him in the office okay. so I could make, make money. So I did not go to college. I had scholarships for, Actually, I wasn't going to have to really pay for college. I had scholarships <laughs> and I gave up all of those um, and started working. I had lived in a 500 square foot duplex that, um, to be honest, my dad had to help pay for. Mm -hmm. um, so a huge and, mental reset of what you thought your path was going to be kind of a thing. Yeah. Huge mental reset. Um, I, re I remember when I was reflecting for this talk, I, uh, for our talk, I, I remember thinking back to getting my paycheck and after childcare expenses, after taking care of the baby, having $10 left for food for a whole week. Wow. And that was, that went on for quite a while. I never told my parents because I didn't want, they were already trying to help out so much. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a big shift. It was a big yeah. shift. What kind of kept you going through all that? But I mean, just your daughter or yeah. Again, I don't know that I, I, I've been trying to reflect if I really thought a lot about that. I just thought this is, this is what I have to do. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I liked working hard. Um, but I think that she was such a huge blessing mm -hmm. and she was given to me as a child to raise her. I mean, I was yeah. raising a child was raising a child <laughs> and, um, yeah. We, we will get to that, but we have had a lot of conversations about that and she's a grown adult now. And we've had conversations about a child, you know, a child raising a child and, and mm -hmm. it was, but she kept me going. She was, <laughs> she was the best blessing ever. So wow. I was so, I was very blessed. Yeah. Awesome. So at the same time, was that, um, I know from our talks in the past that there were some issues with your mom with cancer and things like that. Was that mm -hmm. the same time frame or, different time frame. That was a little bit later. So um, my mom ended up getting colon cancer and dying at age 48. Uh, I was in my 20s okay. when she died. Okay. Um, but but my my daughter was a little bit older then. Um, so mm -hmm. she, yeah, she was about 10 whenever my mom passed away, but my mom had been sick. Well, she had been sick for five years, but in denial that she was sick. Okay. And she, by the time she found out, she only lived nine months. Wow. So that must have been frustrating for you. I, well, I think I'm skipping a few years here from when your daughter was just, <laughs> you know, just a brand new baby till now she's 10. So there had to be something in between there. Did you stay working for your father for quite a while or did life kind of give you any other changes at that point? So I stayed working for my dad for quite a while. And then um, I met my husband, Jonathan, and okay. he... Leah, or Leah, excuse me, Allie, I get them confused. My <laughs> oldest daughter was um, probably about three years old when we met and he immediately okay. fell in love with her. And um, 
he was a volunteer fireman Mm -hmm. in addition to his daytime job. (laughs) And uh, I said, wow, this is really a a neat opportunity. Mm -hmm. And around that same time, an old friend of my dad's came into the office where we worked and he was the rescue diver, um, the master, master rescue diver for the area. And he said, I know you are a strong swimmer. Would this Mm -hmm. be something that you would be interested in? And I thought, oh yeah. He goes, let me (laughs) warn you though. You're going to be the only female diver on the team. Okay. I worked in construction with my dad. I was really the only female on the team. Yeah. Around. Yeah. No kidding. And so that didn't bother me. So mm-hmm. I did. I did start down an avenue and pathway of rescue diver. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Just kind of love the idea of the challenge. I like the idea of the challenge, but I also like the aspect of I could not imagine being a parent that had a child that was missing. Mm-hmm. or um, a loved one that was missing in the water that we weren't able to either try to rescue or mm-hmm. if you were unable to rescue, be able to recover. Mm-hmm. Um, so sure. I, I really felt compassionate about that. And um, showing up for the first day, I beat all the guys in the water anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm course, a little competitive. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Just a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. I think that theme's going to run through here a little bit, but, uh, it is. <laughs> so that competitiveness and then, but then that compassion and care, I mean, some of that was obviously there cause you were going into thinking of physical therapy anyway, but mm-hmm. it sounds like that that was a lot of the foundational type when you started thinking about that, would that be correct in saying? That is completely correct. Um, I really feel connected to people that I, I love being around people. My energy feeds off people. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to help people. And so I think that theme kind of runs through my, the rest of my career and my choices, but, and I also am a very firm believer in giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. So I felt like starting out with the volunteering with the um, rescue diving would be a great way to do that. Okay. Okay. Are there any stories from that time period that, that you'd like to share at all? So there is one story that comes to my mind right away that just tells a lot about community and um, Mm -hmm. the way that I feel and that we were trying to raise our kids. So our daughter at that time was probably five or six years old. And we were happened to have been shopping in a community 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And a call went out to the entire area saying we've got a, a rescue dive that needs to occur. We carried our equipment with us just in case we were in another area and we could be assistance. And we heard the call go out Okay. and it wasn't in our community, but it was in an area. So we went ahead and traveled to that area. We're first people on scene. Like we were mm-hmm. like 10 minutes away. We were first people on scene and here's our five and six year old. We're like looking at her and we're like, huh. <laughs> because I got the, and we determined my husband was, he would do vehicles more so he would do equipment mm-hmm. that and it was submerged where I would do people okay. okay and this was this was a person and so he looked at me and he's like well I'm going to be on the back I'm going to be on your line because you always have a safety on the line and I said okay I said what do we do with this uh, with a child <laughs> 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 because now time's ticking right because yeah. every every minute underneath the water and um it was very interesting because immediately a sheriff deputy came over. He goes, are you a rescue diver? I said, yes, I am. But I said, I have my daughter right here. He said, not a problem. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> he took her, they played, they did all sorts of things. He took her potty. She's telling me the whole incident. <laughs> it was just really neat. He even said, yeah. he goes, I think she did fine over there going to the bathroom. And he, you know, but what the big thing that hit me was, and I didn't even think about this at the time because I was so in the go mode. Mm-hmm. Got the got, we got the guy out of the water. Um, he actually was able to survive to the hospital. So that mm-hmm. was a great, um, great save. And I know some people might say, well, that wasn't safe. But whenever you have a drowning victim, um, being able to get them out and, and be able to resuscitate them is, is a, a so at least save. At least gives them a chance, I would guess, right? Right, it does. And my daughter said to me afterwards, she says, Mom, I saw you pull him out. And the sheriff's work, the deputy was doing, trying to do really good to block you, but I think she was mm-hmm. young enough. She was able to look through legs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, yep, 
<laughs> and, and she said that has stuck to her to this day is the compassion of the deputy. But at the same time, watching her mom, she says, mom, you were trying to help him. Yeah. And she has actually gone into a life of service now too. She has. Incredible. She yeah. has. So um, I think that was a big key for her. And then I was mortified as my mom, like, oh my goodness, what did she see? What did... <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. she said that helped her at a very young age to go, oh my goodness, this, mm-hmm. is, this is big. This is way bigger than my, me. Mm-hmm. I can just imagine the feeling too of having, you know, your husband there working as a team on that would be, would be a good feeling too. So just from my perspective, but. Great feeling. He had my back. Um, he double checked everything when we set, when we would set my tanks up, he mm-hmm. would always be double checking and knowing he was on the other end of the line mm-hmm. was, was a big, is, is very reassuring. I trusted any of my team members, but it was different when your husband's on the other end of the line. Yeah, and I can imagine if it's any Midwest River or lake like what I know that the water more than a foot under is black and you're not going to see anything at all. So it's mainly by feel, I would guess, for the most part. It is completely by feel. <laughs> and unlike some of my partners at the time, I would shut my eyes because you couldn't see anything anyway. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times it would calm me down to slow down my heart rate, to decrease my oxygen intake. So my tanks wouldn't run out as quickly. I would actually shut my eyes and just deep breathe because I knew that my feel was all I could go by anyway. Sure. Okay. Great. So that, were you also doing volunteer firefighting then at the same time? <laughs> uh, that, that Why not? Right? Another life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, got really interested in um, EMS. I decided I would start down the pathway of becoming an EMT with the support of my husband. He actually said, he said, boy, you always want to go into medicine. This is great. You can serve the community. So I started into EMT class, quickly went through the first level. And my instructor said, you need to go through the second level right away. Went to the (laughs) second level. I got down with the second level. My instructor said, you can teach this class. Do you want to go through the third level and be a full paramedic? I said, yeah, it sounds like a great challenge. Let's just keep doing that. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So I had the opportunity. I worked as a paramedic part-time and had to tell my dad I was going to work for him a little less, <laughs> which, was, <laughs> which was difficult. That was another transition. I actually, I, I, w- I could have been set to take over my dad's company. Okay. And I had worked my way up and I was doing all the accounting and I had become the office manager. And mm-hmm. I what his dreams were, mm-hmm. I think was. Were you an only, t- you had, you had one other sister, right? Yeah. Did you have right. no brothers? Yeah. No brothers? No brothers. <laughs> no brothers. No, no. So I, it, but I, my sister went away to college and, okay. and um, took a different avenue. But I think that I vividly remember the day. I remember what he was doing when I told him that I was not going to continue in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a pretty big deal, but following what my heart was telling me and where I thought I was supposed to be was in medicine. Yeah. So had, I was doing the EMT, did the paramedic, worked as a medic, learned a lot. Um, and then had an opportunity to work with the fire department also. So (laughs) that was, that was fun too. (laughs) (laughs) Was this a larger metropolitan type fire department or smaller, smaller department? smaller okay. department. Um, I was working as a medic in a larger community, okay. um, but a smaller fire department. So, um, but it, it's, it, it taught me that, again, I think it was refocusing back on the community is bigger than me. Hmm. I am one single person that is contributing to this community and being able to help. It was just an underlying goal. And the fire chief my lead medics that were teaching me, Mm -hmm. it was phenomenal. The amount of energy and love that they showed for the community and the people Mm -hmm. was, I think, just if it's a smaller community, then everybody kind of knows everybody, I'm guessing that kind of a thing as well, or close to it. Yeah. So you knew everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, I vividly remember showing up to someone's house that I knew very well. And I had to put a breathing tube in them because they were failing. And, and he looked up at my eyes and that was tough. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Were you feeling even then that you wanted to do more than just the paramedic type route? Or were you, was this a, right in your wheelhouse kind of at the time? 
this I thought this was in the wheelhouse at the time. Um, okay. Apparently, others did not. <laughs> 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 so, um, I was in the emergency room dropping a patient off at a bigger community that knew me really well. I was in and out of that emergency room all the time. And one of the ED doctors, the emergency room doctors pulled me aside and he said, um, I want to bring something to your attention. He said, have you thought about going further? And I mm. said, what are you talking about? I didn't have any idea. He and said, you were old, you were old at this time? Sorry. I was about 26 years old. So okay already late. So I had not even yeah. attended college at this point <laughs> because I had gone. Okay. <laughs> the only college I had done was, was a trade school basically for paramedicine, yeah. you know, and, and training and, and um, gone through some of the training. So that was the only training I'd had. I hadn't even attended college and I was about 26 years old. And he said, you might want to consider looking at this. And I said, mm-hmm. I haven't even started college. And he's like, I know. Mm-hmm. And so I went home, I told my husband and I said, he says, well, is that something you're interested in? I said, well, I really don't know. I don't <laughs> really know. He right. goes, well, look into it. And I decided I had to go back to college first. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like John's been super supportive of whatever you wanted your dreams to be over, over the years. He has. He actually told me this week um, when we were talking about okay. this discussion he said i firmly feel god put me in your pathway mm-hmm. to get where we are today awesome. he said i feel like i was put here to help you be able to help other people and he's had well, his I'm own thankful. pathway too so yeah yeah i'm <laughs> thankful for that too so i mean yeah i've you've talked you haven't talked much about his story but i'm sure that's got its own journey as well to go mm-hmm. with it so i know he is i believe he's fire chief of a lacrosse area department now is that is that correct he was a uh, fire chief of shelby um yeah shelby department until about a year ago when he got okay. uh, meningitis and he lost his hearing so oh, no he, way oh man yeah so he has a cochlear implant and so there's okay. another whole journey and that has <laughs> brought <to> us <laughs> but um a, another another um experience yeah so, i guess that yeah. yeah and that's but where yes, he was on firefighting yeah yeah that's a good that's definitely a test something like that can test your marriage a lot i can imagine and your family yes i wanted to kind of talk go back uh, you had talked a little bit about your mom's cancer and things like that and mm-hmm. her denial of it for all the years. Was that kind of eating at you the whole time you were going through this a little bit or um, sitting in the back of your head or how would you describe it? It was definitely sitting in the back of my head. Cause I knew mom was losing weight mm-hmm. and I went to visit her. My parents were divorced when I was young and I went to visit her in Florida and I hugged her and I said, and I, you feel bones. All I could feel was her spine. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I said, mom, something's not right. And she's like, I'm fine. We're here to go to Walt Disney World with her granddaughter. So yeah, she was so yeah. excited. And, and I noticed that Walt Disney World, she was sick. Mm-hmm. And she just couldn't walk or she wasn't doing things. And she, she would take the nap with the, the little kid, the little girl or to my daughter at that time. Yeah. My, sister, my sister and I were running and doing the rides and leaving. Our, you know. <laughs> and so it was just... I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure it out. And my mom was very stoic and in denial. Was she kind of an anti-medicine as well at the time? She was. So she definitely had a very anti-medicine approach. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. It was was definitely an anti-medicine. And she started to, to bring in some holistic medicine. Um, but very, and just did not want to even see a doctor. And I think there's a, uh, and that's, that's a path that we've kind of walked as well as that Jill's very into. I, I mean, we try to balance that path, I think, and, and, you know, trying to avoid antibiotics for our boys, if there's a way that we can treat things without them and that, and that kind of thing. But I know that there's a lot of people today that are fearful of, the medical side just because of the bad cases that do get out or mistakes do get made. Everyone's human. Can you kind of, I don't really want to, I'm not trying to make this controversial or anything like that. And, but the holistic versus traditional medicine, is that something you you've weighed in your head a lot over the years? I have. So when mom first 
started talking about more of a holistic medicine approach to her illness. And at that time, we didn't know it was colon cancer. Mm-hmm. I actually delved into holistic medicine books. Actually, in, people would probably be surprised if they saw my <laughs> library of books. So I have um, holistic medicine books, and I also have what we would call Western medicine books or sure. um, in addition. So I do it, that the thought process. I'm like, at the time I was like, why is she not going to see a physician? Why is she not getting this taken care of? And I remember thinking, just being angry at first, I was like, there are Mm -hmm. opportunities here. Why is she not doing this? Mm -hmm. Then I started reading more and Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I'm understanding a little bit more why. Um, By the time that she passed away, I totally supported it. It was her decision Mm -hmm. of how she wanted to treat her cancer. Um, I think that she was in denial because one week before she died, she looked at me, she says, you knew I was going to die this whole time. Didn't you? Mm. And I did. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a good side to that as well. Uh, With our last child, our, our first two children that Jill and I had together were both IUI uh, Mm -hmm. children, but our third one, we looked into and researched just diet. We weren't planning. We weren't, sat on having another, but if God blessed us with another one, we were all for it. And so Jill changed. She had been, she had PCOS diagnosis. She had mm-hmm. uh, things like that. And, and it didn't happen. We went from a five-year-old to a one-year-old. So we had three years in there where nothing, you know, nothing happened. And, and she researched diet changes and, and it was figuring out what foods worked for her to change her metabolism. And, 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 get things she had her first regular cycles ever basically after after she started looking into what more natural ways were that that would work for her i firmly agree so my mom i think was way ahead of her time okay because she died in year 2000 and she kept telling me she says christy this colon after we found out she had colon cancer she said look at red meat diet and this was before people were even discussing about red meat. And she kept telling me, she goes, you need to look at this. You need to look at what is in these products. You need to be looking at stress levels. I mean, she was, she was telling us things that now people are like, well, yes, we know Mm -hmm. some of these things already. We know increasing your fruits and vegetables helps with colon, you know, helps with being able to keep the gut clean. So she, I think she was ahead of her time at that time. And I firmly agree. I I think that there's a great balance Mm -hmm. um, of, of being able to do Western medicine combined with some Eastern holistic type medicine, because Mm -hmm. you're right there. You can clean up your diet. Um, My oldest daughter does have an inflammatory um, disease. Mm -hmm. And if she doesn't eat right, it flares everything. And she has been able to stay flare free for a year with just eating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's, there's a great balance and, um, I'm a firm believer in prayer. And so I think that being a well-balanced person, mm-hmm. going to the doctor of Western, mm-hmm. like, you know, Western <laughs> is only like one fraction of it now. Yeah. Yeah. So There's my, so my much mind more... did shift. Sorry. Yep. Your mind did shift. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my mind did shift. Like you said, my mind, my mind my, was like, I was frustrated. So I was like, why aren't we doing this? And now stepping back, she has taught me, she taught me there's so much more than just one avenue. Mm-hmm. And taking care of somebody, just like what with with what Jill went through. Do you take that into the residency program as well to talk to the new doctors coming up? Yes. So I try to share my my thoughts. Um, and uh, uh, this is going to be another embarrassing moment. A couple of years ago, now I was given the Teacher of the Year award, <laughs> um, and the reason was. Um, what they stated in the speech was because they were given real life experiences. They were given teaching outside of their surgery, basically their anatomy lessons or their surgical lessons. And they said that they learned a lot from me sharing my experiences and and my pathway of being able to learn more than just what's in the textbook. (laughs) That's cool. Congratulations. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, I know it was. It definitely helped my comfort level. I think with the discussions we had around my surgery, so um, so I appreciate that a lot as well. And I know it made Jill more comfortable because she was. I think that was fairly early days, and her 
research into some of the more holistic things. And it took me a while. It definitely took me a long time to come around because I was, I was not raised with that either. So with any kind of holistic, if you're sick, you go to the doctor and you get, you get fixed up. And so opening up my heart and everything to that was, was part of the journey, I think as well. I think it's extremely important. And um, yep. I, I, I think honestly, medicine, we have seen shift a little bit too. I think that um, when we can get there, I think COVID has helped also shift a little bit that, that, and, and all the trends that you're seeing with decreasing antibiotics. So mm-hmm. um I think there's a shift. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's go back. You're starting to think about med school. Talk us through that a little bit. (laughs) At 26 years old, no college (laughs) under your belt. That had to be, and a young daughter at the same time that had to be, did you have any more kids yet at this point or not? No, no, no more (laughs) kids. (laughs) Well, (laughs) no. So started thinking about it by age 28, finally decided (laughs) that I was going to go that I was going to start school and I started school in August and my mom passed away on sep- um, September of that year, same year. Oh, and um, so started school in August and mom passed away on September 8th. So really was just in school, very short period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and school, I love school. I would be a lifelong learner in school for the rest <laughs> of my life if I could. I think that's why I also chose this pathway because I'm constantly learning. Mm-hmm. Um, but absolutely loved school. Finished my undergrad degree in three years. And at that time said, okay, yes, I think med school is more okay. what I'm going to try to do. Okay. Took the, took the MCAT. If anybody's ever taken those ex- standardized examinations, it's terrible, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> awful. Um, terrible. <laughs> um, I did not get into medical school my first time. I had my wow. first attempt. Okay. So it was, yeah, it was bad. So was it, you didn't prepare enough or you just, it was that tough of a test something? I honestly, I don't know, you know, looking back, I think that um, it was probably a combination that I underestimated the magnitude of the test or I underestimated the um, knowledge that I would need to be gained on the test. Okay. Um, So I did retake the test. I don't recall that I did much better on it. Um, and <laughs> in that amount of time, I thought, boy, I don't think I have what it takes to get into medical school. So, um, that was a shift. Okay. So I, um, decided to start looking for jobs instead. Okay. Um, cause I thought, boy, if I don't get into medical school, what am I going to, where, where, where do I want to be? So I went back and, um, applied and I became EMS education coordinator. So emergency medical services education coordinator over um, a very large district in Illinois and, and love that job because I got to work with firefighters again. I got to work with (laughs) the medics. I got to work with my, basically my teams. Mm -hmm. Um, So so. was it, were you still struggling a little bit though? I mean, that this was really, you wanted to go to med school and it just wasn't kind of working a little bit. Yeah, I, I really wanted to go to medical school. I did not see myself. So when I took that EMS education coordinator job, it, I took the job just because we needed money. Yeah. Um, and I, I and then I love pre-hospital. I love pre-hospital setting and I love working with people, but mm-hmm. that's not where I saw myself for the rest of my life. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so that was kind of hard. That, I mean, that kind of, it was hard mm-hmm. because I thought, boy, I, I really, really would like to go to medical school. I really wanted to be an emergency medicine doctor. Mm-hmm. Clearly not. I did not end up <laughs> doing that, but um, <laughs> so that was really, really hard. I felt like my, I felt like my heart was telling me one thing, but what was occurring was not the same. Mm-hmm. How long did you do that job for then? One year. One year. Okay. Just to uh, be able to retake your MCATs and get it taken care of. So, yeah. So also during that time though, the, the reality still was setting in that what, it, what else would I like to do? My husband and I had many discussions about this. <laughs> oh, that's where this like next part do? comes in. Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is where the next part comes in. So <laughs> what else would I like to do? Okay. Um, 9-11 had occurred. Okay, uh, while gotcha. I was in my undergrad. So 9-11 had occurred. 
and um, I, we had had lots of talks and um, our neighbor was an FBI special agent. Okay. And I, and I finally said after having a lot of discussions and the bioterrorism needs that were there and um, I had research in microbiology in undergrad and okay. um, always had an interest in that too. So I said, okay, if I can't get into medical school, um, not discounting the FBI, we'll get there. But if I can't get into medical school, this would be another position that I could do, that mm-hmm. I felt like I could do and I would be happy with and I would be able to stay in for the rest of my life. Wow, great. So you applied. Yeah. Yeah, I got applied, accepted. so I applied. I got applied to both. <laughs> so that the, in this year it was a very busy year. I was working, yep. and then I applied to the FBI. And and for those that are not familiar with the FBI process, it is a very long process. It can take up to six months. Um, you have to go through lie detectors um, or those polygraph examination, mm-hmm. physical examination. You have to do physical fitness. You have to meet certain runs. And I was a runner at the time, so I knew that would be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot that goes into it. They do background checks and pretty in depth, um, I would imagine too. <laughs> very in depth. Um, very in depth. I, yes, I have some, I have a story that, yes, very in depth. I was blown away. So that was a process. But in the meantime, I also applied to medical school and I told my husband, I said, you know what, right now, whatever journey I'm given, I'm going to be happy either way. This is, okay. this is, this is going to work. Um, my life as an agent would have been completely different than my life in medicine law. Yeah. And I would, I would have had more time, even though medicine takes time away from my family, I would have had more time away from my family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Cause I think one thing you don't get to pick where you get stationed or anything like that. So mm-hmm. it would have been uprooting your entire family or, you know, however you manage that somehow. Right. It would have been uprooting my family and, and, I was really more on the bioterrorism tract. And once I, once I found out, um, I didn't find out at till afterwards and talking to the, the teams that it, it would probably been out on the East coast to begin with mm-hmm. and then elsewhere. So I would not have had as much control over that, but mm-hmm. I felt like I could be happy. So, yeah. And at least you would have been working the long days for sure. I'm sure as a junior agent and things like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you did get accepted into med school at the same time, pretty much, right? So you had a decision to make there? I did. So I got accepted as a, into medical school, had started medical school, and I got my acceptance. Um, I actually got a letter to be, to, I was supposed to be at Quantico um, at the training facility within two weeks. And so <laughs> no pressure. I was in medical school, no pressure. I remember I was in medical school and I got my letter that um, I had received I had made it through. You are supposed to report to Quantico on this date, which was two weeks. <laughs> and I looked at my husband and I was like, oh my goodness. I, I never, first of all, I never dreamed I would get into medical school. And then I never dreamed that I would have two opportunities that I was interested in open up. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a lot of discussions and um, he was a police officer at the time. So okay. he was, he was Springfield police officer and in Illinois. And um, he said, I'm going to ask you a question. And he said, he, he, before that, he put a gun he had, on our mirror in the bathroom. He put a gun on one corner and a stethoscope on the other. <laughs> he goes, these are going to be your tools, right? So yep. this is your tool. You got to make a decision. Which tool are you going to use? And I, I was really struggling. I, you know, I, I really had just started medical school. I was really could not figure out what I wanted to do. And I was going back and forth. I knew that really deep down a deep dive retrospectively I knew Mm -hmm. I was going to stay in medicine and the final day before I had to call them and tell them what I was going to do they knew I was in medical school at this point and um he looked at me and he goes I'm going to ask you one question he goes it's a little bit different for FBI than it's for police but he said I want to ask you a question if your partner got shot by somebody that you guys were going Mm -hmm. after Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, what would be your first reaction? I said, well, I'm on my partner's side. I'm going to make sure they're okay. And I'll start CPR if I have to. He goes, you just answered your, he goes, you just answered what your career path will be. Yeah. And that was the moment I'm, again, I remember where we were standing when he said that. And he said, you need to tell the FBI, you will not be a part of their team. Yeah. So So I'm assuming the correct answer is that 
if from his perspective as the, as the police officer is to you've got to secure the scene you've got to take out who's ever trying to take you out and <laughs> and then worry about your partner well, I appreciate your perspective and I'm sure the guy that used to <laughs> save his life would too but <laughs> you, you got it Tony you that's yeah. exactly what he looked at me and said he's like whoa 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 and I'm like Oh, that thought never even entered my mind. So <laughs> he's like, that thought never entered your mind. Is it like secure scene? I said, no, I got to yeah. take care of the guy that's down. Yeah. And it really, I think, showed that um, although I was willing to, to look at another pathway, I think my heart was still set on medicine. So med school went on. How was that compared to like your undergrad days? Um, I loved you medical school. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was a challenge, but um, I was fortunate enough to get AOA, which is the Honor Society Medical School, and um, it was a challenge, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved medical school. I uh, would go into go into long days, and and they're not near as long as residency, and we'll get there. But <laughs> I go into long days, and I would see you see these patients, and I loved talking to them. I loved learning as much as I could, and. Mm -hmm. um, the whole experience was amazing. I went into a surgery. I always said I would never, first of all, never say never, right? <laughs> exactly. I said I would never be a surgeon. I yeah. said I would never be a surgeon. I went to medical school to be an emergency medicine doctor. Okay. I went in, went into the uh, a 12 hour surgery. This was the day I decided I was doing surgery. Um, mm -hmm. Went into a surgery. It was a big liver resection. And I called my husband and, and after we got out and I said, I'm going to go for my run now. Mm -hmm. He goes, have you looked at a clock? <laughs> and I said, well, I think it's about three o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, it's seven o'clock at night. He goes, what time did you guys get in the OR? I said, 7 a.m. in the morning. And he looked in, <laughs> over the phone. He said, well, we know what you're applying to next. <laughs> so he knew, like, I said, are you kidding? I was 12 hours in the OR. That's amazing. Yeah. He goes, yeah, that's not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We all have different perspectives on that, I guess, right? Yeah. Right. He did not. <laughs> he was not excited about the surgery route. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing 12 hours of, but it's, it's a different thing when you're, I can imagine so completely focused on it that you're not even thinking about any of that. No, it was, it was amazing. Just being able to watch a person come in and then be able to have this huge surgery that's going to increase their survival and yeah, mm -hmm. it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Did you have any mentors kind of helping you along during med school? I did. I had a wonderful pediatric surgeon mentor, and I had a wonderful vascular surgery mentor. And the dean of my, my medical school was very supportive. Um, I couldn't make up my mind for a long time what I was going to do. And I actually enjoyed every rotation except mm -hmm. psychiatry. I did not enjoy psychiatry. Okay. Um, I think that it was, I was in the lockdown unit for my rotation and I was just, mm -hmm. I spent most of the time scared and yeah. um, it was difficult mm -hmm. and it was very stressful. So, um, but the, the Dean of my school said, <laughs> and I know a lot of people can relate to this. If you become a surgeon, please don't lose your personality. <laughs> um, that's, that was exactly what he told me. And I, <laughs> I was like, Oh, <laughs> I've met a couple um, guys like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or not to, not to, not to, not to say that it's all guys that are like that. Cause I, I think I've had my, uh, had my share on both sides, but yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons I asked before about bringing the empathy part into your residency mm -hmm. program is I think too many people have run into doctors that just have zero bedside manner or, or that empathy somehow got left out of their genetic makeup at some point. Glad, I'm glad to hear that the doctors were talking to you about that early on. They were, they were very, and um, we'll touch back on that empathy because I've, I also have a new perspective on some of these people that don't show empathy. I think that just working with physicians, um, okay. but they were very, it was, they were very, um, very concerned. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, First of all, I'm 32 years old graduating medical school. No one can really change my personality now. <laughs> so I, I really had a very um, naive approach to sort of what surgical residency was like. Okay. So, um, but the pediatric surgeon, he was, he, they were very, the vascular surgeon, they said, you will be great. The pediatric surgeon told me, because you need to think about pediatric surgery with your 
mm-hmm. with your um, personality. Mm-hmm. And um, but they were all very supportive. Great. Right. So then from there, it was you were able to get on to the University of Iowa for residency. Yeah. But I decided to have a baby. Well, um, we were fortunate <laughs> enough and blessed with a baby uh, six weeks before residency started. <laughs> you had the baby or you you had, had the, baby. the baby? Yeah. Wow. Had, I had our second child three weeks or six weeks before residency started. So I was a postpartum mom um, <laughs> breastfeeding and starting a surgical residency and um, at, a, at a, a very large academic center, yes. <laughs> so typically my, my picture of residency is 100 hour weeks and things mm-hmm. like that. And, and so you're trying to breastfeed a newborn mm-hmm. and somehow, and your, other, your older daughter probably was how old then? She was 14? Ish. Well, actually, she graduated high school and I graduated medical school within okay. the same 30 day time period. So she was actually <laughs> transitioning to college and well, that's we had a at newborn. least a little better, I guess. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was a huge transition. So we had a baby um, six weeks before medical or before residency started. My husband left his police job, which what he loved. He absolutely mm-hmm. loved his job as a police officer. He would have been on track to be a detective. And he had to leave that career for me. Um, We moved into a very small apartment in Iowa City. And you're correct. The amount of work I underestimated for surgery (laughs) residency. Um, I mean, I can see how you'd be an automaton with no personality after working that many hours, that many weeks in a row. So, yeah. (laughs) It's, it's, I, I look back now, there's, there's time periods I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Um, Months I don't remember. And unfortunately, our, our, our daughter that was born six weeks before residency has said at times, she goes, well, you missed that time when I was growing up in certain areas. And that, and that has been a struggle. We've talked about that quite a bit because I did. I was yeah. working all the time. And if I wasn't working, I was trying to sleep and eat. But I will be honest, at night, what she doesn't remember, of course, is those nights that I would come home from the hospital at 8 or 9, 10 o'clock at night. I would stay up the rest of the night breastfeeding her and I would nap in a chair just to spend time mm-hmm. because yeah, that was, awesome. yeah, the, the guilt was yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's a life, it's kind of, it's a definite sacrifice for sure to, to do that path. And, and there's a lot of times, I mean, I used to travel a lot for work as well. So every other week, I would be gone for Monday through Friday and it's somewhat the same thing. So my seven year old, the first two years mm-hmm. of his life, I was gone every other week and FaceTime just doesn't cut it or anything like that, you know? <laughs> no, so no. And it means yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah. It means, yeah. And like you said, career being gone. I think mm-hmm. of truck drivers being gone. Mm-hmm. Um, oil yeah, my rig. Dad, yeah. My dad yeah. was a truck driver when I was growing up. So there was, he'd be gone for, four, three, four weeks at a time sometimes. And this was back before cell phones or anything like that. And so mm-hmm. it was, there was very, we talked to him once a week, I think would be about the most we'd get to, to talk to him. How long was residency for you? Um, yeah, so res- surgical residency was five years and I did a critical care fellowship. Actually, I, I um, did a non-traditional, everything I, I feel like in my path was a little <laughs> non-traditional. I did a non-traditional pathway. So I did... Um, Three years of surgery residency. I stepped out for a year, did a one year surgical critical care fellowship, and then stepped back in and completed my last two years of surgery residency. So okay. after my after my surgical critical care fellowship, I was able to sit for boards. I thankfully passed boards, even though I wasn't even completed with surgery residency. So um, okay. took a non-traditional pathway there, but we were a total of six years in Iowa City. Okay. My wife, like I said, my wife's sister just graduated there. She's taking kind of a gap year right now because she finished in her undergrad in three and a half and then she wants to be a PA after that. That's awesome. That's great. We need, we need uh, associate providers, PAs, NPs that they are phenomenal. They bring a whole different aspect to the team, which is great. Mm -hmm. So after, well, uh, about your, I mean, your surgical residency, was there anything you had to focus on emergency medicine a little bit? Cause you had the, re- the, mm-hmm. the one year program in the middle there. Uh, was that still, I'm, I don't know Iowa city very well, but is that, 
possible to do there and get a lot enough activity. Obviously, it must be if they have the program to get enough activity to keep you busy and learning and things like that in a good and bad way, I guess. <laughs> Iowa City, yeah, in a, in a good and bad way, right. So Iowa City Hospital is a huge hospital. Um, yep. They had hundreds of, I mean, it's a big hospital. Mm-hmm. At the time when I was there, we had over 800 residents even working in the hospital because it was so busy, so large. They had every specialty that you can imagine. And um, so they, they, it was a fairly new program to be able to step out like I did and be able to transition to the critical care and everything. That was, that was a new program at that time uh, Mm -hmm. to be able to do that there. Uh, But they did, they did offer quite a bit. I will be completely honest um, that uh, I've started to share this with the residents here. Surgical residency, I greatly underestimated, greatly underestimated. After my second year of residency, I became very disconnected. I didn't, I wasn't myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Those thoughts of what the Dean said, you don't let them, don't let them change. And so it was right at the beginning of my third year residency, I took a leave of absence. Okay. I hadn't seen, I hadn't really been seeing my daughter my husband and I were having marital problems because you, you're, you're at the hospital. Yeah. I really only knew two locations. I knew where we lived and I knew the hospital. Mm-hmm. And if one route was snowed in, it was really difficult for me to figure out another <laughs> route. Like literally yeah. that was my life. And I, my grandmother got sick around the same time. Mm-hmm. And I told my husband and, and I actually, it was a program associate program director there pulled me into her office and she said, you're changing. She goes, you used mm-hmm. to be happy. She goes, you're becoming withdrawn. And she says, I'm guessing you, you weren't exercising to... or no. you know, working on your faith at all at the time or anything like that. So, yeah. yeah, you got, you just nailed where I was heading with that <laughs> message. I had lost who I was. I mm-hmm. was not studying the Bible, which I have always done. Mm-hmm. I was not working out anymore, which I've always done. I was not able to spend time with my family. I was feeling guilty about who I was, what I was, what the path I was on. And she told me, she says, you have to go on a two week leave. I'm putting you automatically on two week leave. That two week leave turned into several weeks because I said, I don't know. Once I got out, I went straight to my grandma because she was sick. And I walked, I remember walking into the emergency room and it was the same team that told me I should go into medicine originally. Yeah. And this was a God intervention. I am convinced (laughs) she broke her arm. And I walked in and it was the same, he said, and the doctor looked at me and he's like, I'm so proud of you. You're going to make it. You're going to do this. And it was just like all these people surrounded me. It was my grandma that broke her arm and I was there, (laughs) but they surrounded me to try to lift me up. And so that was a pivotal moment for me saying, okay, I guess I am on the right path, but Mm -hmm. I couldn't lose sight of who I was anymore. Yeah. 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 So you had to balance a little bit better somehow, somehow in the midst mm-hmm. of those hundred hour weeks, you had to balance something. So. Right. Right. So. And this was right, right during the transition of when they were said they were going to, they, they tried to do 80 hour work weeks. Okay. Um, okay. Try we didn't to. really live by, we didn't live by that there. We are, our, our time card said 80 hours. We were not doing 80 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a reason that it should be limited hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I mean, there's, there's a reason for having you there a lot also, I can imagine, to see different mm-hmm. things and to just try to help out wherever you can help out. I, is, but at a, at a certain point, you're a zombie and you're not learning anything, I can guess, also. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. You don't learn anything and you start losing a little bit of who you are and that is actually that goes ties back into the empathy of, of the loss of empathy. I, I think that some physicians have mm-hmm. because during residency, you get to a certain point where you are a ta- automatic. Mm-hmm. You have learned the procedures, you know, the procedures. Now you're just like, let's just, you mm-hmm. lose touch with your emotions at that point because survival mode kicks in mm-hmm. and you lose that. Okay. Okay. How did you and John get back on the same page again? So we went to counseling. Okay. Um, we had to go to counseling and um, it was hard. It was yeah. hard work um, yeah. to know where we had come from to where we were. It was hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jill and I have done that too. And, and, and we've done both individual and couples. Mm-hmm. And I think people don't realize enough how much that can help you when things break down and, 
and it's communication, but it's also being willing to listen to each other and let those frustrations out. So I would, I would guess there was some of that on his side that he was carrying all the weight theoretically. Yeah, no, you, you nailed it again. That is exactly what happened. Um, we went to individual counseling to, 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 together counseling, couple counseling. But I think part of it was too, I was feeling guilty. I pulled him away from his career. Mm-hmm. He had to stop his career. He had to shift goals. And then um, I remember him telling me, you're not the person I married because I had changed so much during residency that that leave was that leave that that associate program director mm-hmm. made me take it initially. And then I took extra was so important yeah. for our family. And well, I'm guessing so it probably in- saved your marriage. Uh- I think it saved my marriage. Yeah. Yeah. My husband tells me now that he would, he was like, I was bound to determine nothing. It was not going to fail. Um, but I, I truly believe that it, it saved my marriage. And unfortunately, I mean, I thanked her many times, but unfortunately she actually passed away. The associate program director passed away of lung cancer while I was still there. Oh, okay. But at least she had the fortitude to stand up and tell you that, I guess, and then make the, make the room Mm -hmm. for you to take that time. So, um, and I, I don't know. I just see so many people that don't realize how hard marriage can be sometimes and they give up way too easily uh, and, and just are too selfish for their own goals within the marriage or don't realize that it's not just falling in love with each other. It's a lot more than that. Oh, marriage is hard. (laughs) (laughs) It Um, is. Oh, my wife's like five feet away, but yeah. yeah. (laughs) It's so hard, but it is so rewarding. Once you get past that point of, of adversaries at times, Mm -hmm. um, you're still going to have moments. You're still going to have moments, but getting past that point is so rewarding, Mm -hmm. um, to know that you can look at your partner and say, okay, we are on the same page. We may not like each other at this moment, but we're still on the same page. (laughs) And, and that is, that is just, it's, it's phenomenal. So Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so after surgical residency, how did it feel finishing up and getting your coat and, and all of that at the end? So at the end of surgical residency, it felt like a weight had lifted. Um, a new weight came on, (laughs) but (laughs) a weight had lifted. Um, I was like, wow, I am out of this training program and I survived a, we survived. Mm -hmm. I looked at my husband that day and I said, we survived as a family. And yeah. he's like, yes, we're going to be okay. Um, that so training you were, program. You were 39 at the time or something around that? Um, let's, let's see. I was in 32, 34, 5, 6. I think I just turned 40 or Which, right around because it was six years down there. Yeah. For anybody that doesn't so. know, that's about 10 years later than the typical resident. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yes. But not that yeah. that's a bad and thing. I'm just saying 10 years older. No. <laughs> I know with a one-year-old at 50 versus a one-year-old at 40, there's a big difference. So I can imagine being in residency 10 years later than typical would have a, the similar effect. But <laughs> It did. And I, you just made me remember another thing. It, I received the award for the most energetic resident. And the, the speech was, um, they always do what we call a roast, where the the residency class underneath you likes to give you a proper farewell. Okay. Um, and I received the award as the most energetic resident, even though I was at least 10 years older than most of the other <laughs> residents. So um, that was, that was tells you a little bit about my personality. Yeah. I started to gain my personality back and was more who I am. And, um, but yeah, I received that award. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> so what was after residency for you? Um, after residency cross? and fellowship, yep, we came straight to lacrosse. So we came, okay. like I, like you said in the intro, we actually came up here for an interview. Um, I, I knew I was coming here. Um, during, it was my third year of residency. Actually, I knew I was coming here. We came up here for a visit. I had met the Gunderson recruiting team huh, at the end of my first year, early second year. They pulled us up here as a second year resident. I met Dr. Co- Tom Cogbill as okay. a second year resident. And as soon as we pulled into town and our daughter at that point, she was what, two, three years old, somewhere in that range. She looked at um, Jonathan and I, she goes, well, we're home. And we kind of looked at her and said, what do you mean we're home? She goes, this is our home. (laughs) And it kind of struck us. And then we came up a year later and she goes, well, when are we moving home? 
Yeah. What time? What time of year was that 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 they brought you up there? Well, I probably wasn't winter. I'm guessing so. <laughs> it was late winter. It was late winter. It was okay. Right now, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was late winter. Um, but she got to go to the children's museum. We did fun things. And the people the, the, the people that we met were absolutely amazing. And not even just at the surgery department or not at the hospital. What we noticed is the community was amazing. Um, yeah. We would yeah. walk down, talk to people downtown, and everybody was just wonderful. I, to be completely honest, um, my family back home has more of a southern accent. And when I came okay. up here, we were not sure what Yasher, Yabetcha, or Usta actually meant. <laughs> I, I remember vividly being at Ace Hardware asking a question, mm. and my husband and I looked at each other and said, what was that word? We didn't even <laughs> know what that word was. <laughs> it's just interesting, different dialects from different yes. regions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously you liked what you saw and decided to make mm-hmm. that your home then. So Yes, yes. So yeah, what year, we, we what year did you come, move up to La Crosse? 2014. 2014. So that was wasn't long before we got to meet for my for my. So you started working exactly. in the ER and doing trauma surgery and just regular regular surgery. So I worked. Um, yeah, I was doing trauma surgery and intensive care. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also an intensivist, a surgical intensivist, and then um, working in the general surgery also. Okay. So yeah, and we met because of your, your more of emergency surgery. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I remember after, so I think my first perforation was in October and I had a different doctor for that. He said, well, we could try to do get surgery approved, but then insurance likes you to have two episodes before they really approve surgery. I'm like, great. So I got to go through all this again, one more time before I can get it taken care of. And just the way insurance is these days, I guess, but that was the worst pain I thought it was my appendix at first, but I can't imagine just if that's anything like childbirth, you can have it, I guess. So, (laughs) (laughs) but it was somehow uh, we were actually down in Iowa that weekend when it happened. And somehow I had, I had to have my son back to go over to his mother's house um, that Sunday afternoon. It was on a Saturday night. I woke up in the middle of the night, just couldn't move. And then somehow I was able to drive him back home drove into the ER and then my car sat there for a week because <laughs> should have probably not my smartest decision ever, but, uh, but it worked out. So, yeah. I don't know how you drove home. And you, yeah. I, I think that I, I like your analogy of childbirth, but childbirth, we get a special little gift, right? At the very end yeah. Of that. yeah. And, and for going through somebody that has that type of um, problem that's occurring or pathology that's going on, wow, I don't know how yeah. you drove home. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely wasn't my, yeah, my finest hour, I don't think. But, and Jill didn't believe me at first either. What was wrong? She just thought I was trying to avoid spending time with her family. So, <laughs> and going to church with her that morning, I'm like, no, really, I can't move. And then when I called her from the ER and told her that I had that, the uh, perforated bowel and she's like, Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that was, a, yeah, I imagine she felt very bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she did. She did. So when did you start working with the residents? Day one. Um, Day one. So worked with the res- we, we since we're a teaching institution and working with the residents. And um, I love teaching. I love education because they're our future. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it also is rewarding to watch them grow and, um, and talk about their family lives, talking about their faith. Um, mm-hmm. and do you see a lot of that? Happen. Do you see a lot of that today? Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. So, um, there are different type of training institutions all over the country. Some training institutions are, are not quite like what we are here. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, we are they're they're open and mm-hmm. um, I think it's it's nice when the residents feel comfortable they come into my office if they've had a bad day I'll have residents come in just shut the door sit down and um, I always have Kleenexes sitting next to the chair because mm-hmm. they feel comfortable or I, I also tell them I said you can sit in my office if you need just moments alone tell me I will be happy to leave you can have quiet mm-hmm. time whatever you need but um, we see some pretty rough things and the residents need an outlet to be able to talk about that. We talk about faith. Um, Mm -hmm. We talk about why they're here in this point in their life. Mm -hmm. 
and what do they, why do they think? And sure. it's just, it's, I have those type of discussions. We, I, I feel like I can teach people to operate mm -hmm. the compassionate side of things and being able to get into human touch is a different, different level. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I find the most joy mm -hmm. being sure. able to help them. Sure. Sure. And cause that's when you could start to see if they don't have a way to deal with that. That's when they start to lose themselves kind of like you did a little bit. Yes. I didn't have anybody I was really talking to down at the university of Iowa. Our residency was not as collegial as this residency is here. Mm -hmm. um, we were all competitors with each other. Gotcha. And so there was a different level. You didn't have somebody that was looking out for you here. This, this residency is so collegial. They're constantly looking mm -hmm. out for each other, but um, it's, it's nice that you can also share your experience with, with somebody that's been, that's been through it before too. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So where are you taking it? What are your plans from here? I mean, are you going to just, are you going to keep on keeping on with surgery and, and training and, and all of that? Yes. So this year has been a really big year. This past year has been a really big year for me, I, um, even with COVID and, and stuff. Um, I, two years ago, I'm now the, the chairman of the critical care department at, at a local hospital. Congrats. And um, thank you. You did, you did and, say the name a few times already, so but I'll forgive. <laughs> oh, I did. Sorry. Um, they're such a great group. I just cannot even say is enough thing. So yeah, I was trying to avoid saying, but all my comments are not affiliated with the hospital at all. It's just, just yes. me. Um, but it's yeah. such a great group of people and I just cannot say enough, but um, that's probably why I said the name, but yeah. I, um, I continue doing my trauma research. So I continue doing research, um, continuing with publications. I recently had to resign as I didn't have to resign, but I resigned as associate program director, but I'm re remaining very active in education because of my time requirement with the critical care unit, sure. um, which brings a whole nother avenue. It's so fun to have this role and working with the residents in a different realm too. So, mm -hmm. And I get mm -hmm. to work with medicine residents too, which is fun. Um, <laughs> so you mean, non, I, I, are you, you mean non-surgical residents? Non-surgical yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Non <laughs> residents. Yeah, non-surgical residents. And that is, a, I love hearing their stories and getting to know them too. So I think that um, my future, I have goals. Um, I, I would love to be, have more leadership roles mm -hmm. in the future. Um, and as long as I can continue to incorporate my faith and stay true to myself, mm -hmm. I do not want to go through what I went through in residency again, sure. although it made me stronger to who I am today um, and We'd, be able to continue to work with patients. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like between having to kind of reset all of your plans coming out of high school to your challenges in residency and everything, do you, I don't want you to pick one biggest challenge you had to deal with, but it sounds like you're exactly where you, you feel you should be today. So all those challenges kind of made it worth it. Yeah. So I, I can easily pick the biggest challenge. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest challenge was surgery residency for me, being okay. close to losing your marriage, losing who you are as a person. I've never gone through that before. And mm -hmm. retrospectively was that really all surgery residency or was it a culmination of, of everything that happened previously? Yeah. So heading down a pathway, your dreams changed. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I felt like that was very much God again was telling me, you're not, you don't need to go physical therapy. We're going to, we're going to reroute you. I also said mm -hmm. I would never have kids. And once you know, I got pregnant in high school, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and then you had the one, that, you had the one daughter right before residency. Didn't, yeah. You had yeah. another daughter too, didn't you as well? Or, a, or a son. Yeah. yeah. And then a the son. son you were pregnant with that you were pregnant yeah. with when you were doing my surgery. So. <laughs> Correct. Yes. So, um, and, and we, we, we have, um, we have kids in heaven also. So we've lost a couple. Okay. So we, um, we've yeah. had our life that, challenges. Yeah, don't dismiss the challenge of that either. That can, that's a big deal. And we've, yeah. we, we, that's a big deal. So I think that all along, I'm, this is where I'm supposed to be. I truly feel, and, and again, my husband, and I had this conversation last week. I said, this is where, even though we've had these challenges along the way, this is where I'm supposed to be. I feel in my heart. Um, when I pray, I feel that 
this is, this is it. And um, I feel like we're supposed to be in lacrosse. Mm-hmm. We've had discussions about opportunities. I've had opportunities to move. Um, mm-hmm. And we, we've talked about those and that I really truly feel this is where I'm supposed to be. I don't feel like I'm done yet. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like there's probably more to come, but um, <laughs> it is. It's the biggest challenge is residency. And I will say that my now adult daughter who has her own family um, told me, she said, mom, she said her, she started high school, the, my first year of medical school. So we started basically, we were freshmen together is what we used to say. <laughs> she started, we were freshmen together. And um, she said, as hard as it was, I didn't see you very much. She said, but what you taught me as a female and as a mom is, is that I can do anything I ever want to do. She goes, you came from a teenage mom and then you were able to get to the, where you are today. And she said, it just showed me yeah. so much. So I, I took that. I, I looked, looked at my husband. I was like, okay, then that was a win. <laughs> I'll take yeah. that as a win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause she literally taught me. She, she grew up with kid, right? Yeah. It was a kid yeah. raising a kid. Um, well, my, my sister was a mother at 19 and, and grandmother at 38. So you can kind of empathize with that, but, yeah. but yeah, that's tough. Yeah. That's definitely tough. And your younger daughter will hopefully, you know, she'll understand that those sacrifices at some point and it's tough for them too. So you just can't dismiss mm-hmm. it. I don't think you have to mm-hmm. listen and, and let them help them deal with it. I think. Yeah. And I think, and, and her and I talked about this recently because I showed her some pictures and she's like, well, you used to do this with me, mom. And I said, like, yeah, you just can't, re- you just don't remember those times. And mm-hmm. so her realizing that I wasn't just out having fun. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I was learning. So, so what yeah. is, how, how has COVID changed things for you? Oh, I'm a people. <laughs> we could person. probably talk all. We could probably talk all day yeah. about that. But yeah, yeah, I'm a people person, and <laughs> COVID has been so. I love to give hugs. I, yep. it, to me, so the biggest, the biggest aspect is there is such power in human touch. So mm-hmm. let's go back to the holistic medicine. Yep. There is power in human touch, and there's healing in human touch, mm-hmm. and to not be able to touch people to me actually is just phenomenal. I feel like that you, we, we can, we can help somebody that's sick by human touch alone, mm-hmm. yeah. which we know strengthens their immune system. Mm-hmm. And um, so it, 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 that's been very hard. That's been yeah. extremely hard. So and I would I say that's the biggest hard part. The isolation as well of all the patients. I can, can't imagine. Oh. I mean, I had, I don't, I don't even know if I mentioned this, but I had ankle surgery uh, almost two years ago, was it now? Yeah, two years ago, and then caught a blood clot from that. So I ended up having a DVT from my iliac crust all the way to my ankle, basically, and had to have Dr. Gunderson in interventional radiology clean Mm -hmm. it out for me. But I was in the ICU for a couple days and just in the hospital for a week altogether for that as well. So um, I can't imagine if my wife wouldn't have been able to visit me or any any of that at the time and that was it was bad enough then I can't imagine what it's like now so it's um you walk through the waiting room and no one's in the waiting room yeah you walk into a patient's room that's dying no one's in there yeah so it's it's hard Mm -hmm. is it beginning to I mean it's you can at least have visitor a visitor now mm-hmm. I think <laughs> yeah and actually I think this week we may have lifted it to I, I, I have uh, been on some education time this week so I think we actually lifted it that there might be able to be two visitors in summer in oh, some cases so yeah crazy. so we started yeah, I know <laughs> we have started lifting that um a little bit it is so important for these families and these these patients to have family interaction mm-hmm. I can't imagine being a patient during the height of COVID Mm -hmm. and laying there in their bed and, and not being able to touch your family member or feel their presence even in the room. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is starting to to lighten Um, as physicians. um, I enjoy family involvement. I want family there. Well, I like to hug family. So (laughs) um, 
it's it's just a different <laughs> it's just it's nice to see them back I will mm-hmm. say um, I was getting coffee a couple weeks ago and now the coffee shop one of the family members came up and said hey why don't we have coffee every day at this time together and I was like that sounds like a great idea to me <laughs> and, um, and it was one of the family members that uh, their loved one I elaborated on so mm-hmm. um, it just is it's nice it brings a smile to my face to see the things that are starting to change I think we've learned a lot about COVID I think yeah. that um we we learned a lot as an, a nation and, and politics aside. I, I don't try to stay out of politics completely, but yeah. Um, yeah, there's a too. lot that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot we've learned and, and about humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know my a coworker of mine. His mother's in a nursing home, and they barely got to talk to her for six months, and didn't get to see her or anything like that. And I think the nursing homes are probably the worst of all just because the standard of care can be tough to meet regardless especially for some of the people that are less ambulatory and things like that that it was really tough I mean I can't imagine being on the front lines what that what that looked like for for anybody let alone living it on the outside well and the fear for a nursing home if you get it one person in with COVID and I think that I that would be a huge fear. One of one of my uh, very dear colleagues worked in a nursing home during this time, and um, mm-hmm. it was very difficult. The mm-hmm. amount of stress is different than what we faced on the front line. Um, yeah. Stress. I mean, everybody had their own different stressors. Every bit of it very real, but it it was different. And I just the fear of somebody getting sick, and then when one, one one did get sick, you're worried yeah. about the rest of the place. Yeah. 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 So it's good to hear things are kind of starting to trend back mm-hmm. to normal. Do you hopefully that's going to stay that way? I'm guessing. I'm hopeful. Next. I'm very, very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I want it back the way it used. I know everybody keeps saying that. I want it back the way it used to be. Um, so I'm very hopeful that we we yeah. start to get back. It, it again, just um, the human touch, fellowship, being able to have a cup of coffee or being able to have a meal with a person that to me that's that's very great bonding time we haven't been able to do that the other hard part is is that we found um in our own providers so our providers are taking care of really sick patients and they can't really connect with other providers right now because mm-hmm. of the sins so i think having just time to have coffee time or um, fellowship time is very huge. Yeah, and without, with without a mask staff. and face shield on and all that. <laughs> oh, goodness. I don't know that I'm going to recognize the people. I said that the other day. I said, oh my goodness, I, I forgot what your nose looks like. <laughs> that was one yeah, of my it's... partners. I looked at it, I was like, I forgot what your nose looks like. <laughs> yeah, yep, no kidding. Yep. Try dating in this time, in this period of time oh, or I something cannot. like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I will say I just cannot even imagine dating at my age. Yeah. And then second of all, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, no I was kidding. like, second yeah. of all, yeah. I'm not over. starting over. Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> That's so I said, you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so any last words of wisdom, anything that you'd like to share? I would just say if anybody is ever questioning what their pathway is, I would say just really trying to focus on their heart um, and faith, whatever that, whatever their faith is, whatever their faith base is. Mm -hmm. um, And know that you can do about anything that you want to do Mm -hmm. um, and be able to be successful and don't give up. I mean, I was accepted. I was, got pregnant and was given a blessing as a, a high school senior and then didn't get into medical school for the first go around, got into medical school, stepped out of surgery residency, came back in after leave. And, and so just don't give up. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's crazy how some of those turns in life turn out to be some of the best things that could ever happen to us. Even they don't seem like it at the time, maybe, but just got to have faith and take it through to the end. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. It's hard. It is really yeah. hard. It is really hard, but also know you're not alone. There's people yeah. out there that have, have done that. And, and again, that's very powerful. Community is so powerful. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much for having me. I wanted to record a little postscript to this just to thank Dr. Waller for being on the podcast today. And just to the 
just how just had to say how awe-inspiring her story is and how hard she's worked to to get to where she is today and just it it's a good reminder of how sometimes those those paths in life that you think might be knocking you completely out of your comfort zone or or off the direction that you thought you were going to be can really be a blessing in disguise and can get you eventually you can get to exactly where you were meant to be and i think that's definitely the case with her and she was a critical piece of my care team more than once so i think she would be the first to say and be humble and say that it was definitely a team effort at the hospital with my case and it definitely was uh, but somebody also had to be the person on the line with the knife cutting into me, and that was her. So I am so grateful for uh, the new life that it's given me and for the changes that have taken place in my life since then. Uh, it's one thing to to go through through something like a diverticulitis and and be at the point where it can go one of several ways, and most of those ways aren't very good. But we're on the other side of that now, and we're definitely looking up to our next phases in life and attacking life and trying to make the best thing we can out of life. And I think that's all anybody can ask. And so I really appreciate the message that Dr. Waller has, and I and I wish her nothing but the best in all of her future endeavors. She's making a difference in the world, and and her she's doing raising a family at the same time and building a great marriage and being a great person and a great child of God. So my challenge for this week would be to take a look at your life and see how can you work to improve yourself a little bit and work to discover what your goals are for your life and what can you do to help try to reach those goals and try to just take one day at a time, one thing at a time. Don't try to fix everything overnight but make a plan for yourself. Don't just do it without thought. Don't do it without prayer. Don't do it without uh, working with your spouse or your significant other, if you have one of those. If if you don't, that's okay. You can definitely make progress on yourself uh, as you are. God loves you for just who you are. And I I hope that this, that this message from Dr. Waller today hits you in a place uh, like it hit me that that uh, you really can make uh, make exactly what you want out of your life. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take love and faith and just the willingness to listen to your dreams and to be ready to work your butt off to make those dreams come true. So once again, thank you, Dr. Waller, and I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. Like it, subscribe it, uh, and help us out with uh, reviews, help us out with publicizing it. Uh, we can use anything and everything to help uh, get this word spread out because I think uh, especially this week's is a great message for anybody out here that, that needed it. Mm-hmm.